welcome to atcm the emergency medicine channel today we are going to discuss a case of breathlessness shall we start yeah a 70 year old man known case of type 2 diabetes copd present to the emergency room with breathlessness and fever of 2 days duration okay on our initial 10 second assessment the patient was conscious oriented and obeying commands okay. coming to the primary survey airway patent no hoarseness gurgling or stridor was noted coming to breathing the respiratory rate was 30 per minute saturation of 89% in room air bilateral wheeze present using accessory muscles for respiration okay. at this point of time we started the patient initially putting the patient in propped up position and also on nebulization coming to circulation pulse rate of 110 beats per minute mm. bp of 140 90 mm of mercury mm. all peripheral pulses were equally palpable okay two large bore iv cannulas were inserted during this point of time coming to disability gcs of 15 by 15 and pupil bilaterally equally reacting to light coming to exposure temperature of 100.2 degree fahrenheit and grbs of 180 mg per deciliter okay injection pcm 1 g iv stat was given at this point of time okay see uh, so we have an elderly gentleman who is a known copd type 2 diabetes mellitus has come to your ed with an acute onset of breathlessness breathlessness has since when how many days or uh, hours or days uh, since two days sir since last two days he is having breathlessness any history of fever cough that we can come to the sample history so when you evaluated him you said the airway was patent there is no hoarseness of voice gurgling or stridor breathing respiratory rate was 30 per minute saturation 89 percentage in room air why didn't you start oxygen through this patient uh, because uh, we already know that the patient is a known case of copd mm. so uh, in uh, copd patients it is hypoxia that is the respiratory dry okay. so we have to maintain a saturation of only 88 to 92 percentage in room air okay so what is a normal physiology that you have said is normally for individual who is not having copd their drive will be what their drive will be the carbon dioxide build up carbon dioxide will be the normal simulator but for a patient with copd their simulation is hypoxia so constantly there should be some amount of hypoxia if you are over correcting that hypoxia by giving that oxygen that drive will not be there and there will be lot of carbon dioxide build up and they will go for respiratory acidosis so that we need to prevent so we have to be very specific that in copd we have our target saturation is around 88 percentage to 92 percentage only so that is very important so this is only the target percentage in patient with copd so unwantedly oxygen should not be given to this group of patient so that is the reason why you didn't start him on uh, oxygen and uh, you start said that you started him on nebulization so what is the preferred nebulization regimen that you need to start here Uh, so what is the regimen of nebulization what nebulization you have started for him so we started on uh, neb duolin sir what is duolin contain uh, contain salbutamol and uh, ipratropium bromide sir. okay so basically what you wanted to give you have to give a beta okay. what is beta agonist like salbutamol Salbutam. along with you need to give ipratropium mm-hmm. also which will take care of the smaller airway so that is the reason in basically in copd it is more of a smaller airway issue so you have to give ipratropium as well as you have can given duolin that is a combination what is the l salbutamol what is the difference between normal salbutamol and levo salbutamol you have uh, two components see when you have uh, this thing you will have l salbutamol so l salbutamol salbutamol levo salbutamol and you have normal salbutamol so what is the basic difference theoretically speaking levo salbutamol will cause de- less tachycardia that is only one major difference clinically that that would say when comparing to salbutamol tachycardia chances is less with levo salbutamol so whenever you see the side effects of basically salbutamol one of the major side effect they will can have palpitation they can have tremors all those things is less with levo salbutamol so that is the additional advantage of levo salbutamol so when you say duolin nebulization it is basically a combination of levo salbutamol with ipratropium so that is what one set of nebulization you have started depending upon the severity of nebulization you need to give more frequently and there are certain adjuncts that also we need to add that we will discuss in the course of discussion so circulation wise the heart rate was 110 
why the heart rate was on the higher side the two reasons can be it can be due to the temperature yes. fever and also the patient was breathless yes. so these are the two reasons why the heart rate is on the higher side and bp was also 140 90 which is a quite reasonable blood pressure and he never had any gcs drop if the same patient is coming with the gcs of 10 by 15 what will you anticipate uh, sir, we are suspecting an impending respiratory failure in this patient sir. so impending respiratory failure that means this patient has already gone for respiratory failure when the GCS is very low, one thing, there can be multiple reasons. So, one of the important reasons can be an increase in the carbon dioxide. So, that can be one of the reasons. You have to think of other reasons also. But in this situation, what you have to remember, patient is an underlying uh, COPD patient who has come with decreased response. One important thing that you need to remember is that he can be having either a PCO2 buildup and sugars was normal. So, we have ruled out a hypoglycemia also. So, 10 by 15 GCS, the in investigation that you need to do in the, at this point of time will be a major important investigation is ABG. So, that anyway, I think you will be discussing. You can go to the next slide. So, okay. adjunct to the primary okay. survey. So, ABG was taken with showing a pH of 7.265, PCO2 65 and bicarb of 26.5. Okay. So, uh, let's uh, see. pH of 7.265. So, pH of 7.265. So, it is on the lower sides so what has happened to the carbon dioxide pco2 whether it has gone to the same side or to the opposite side it has gone to the opposite side it has increased so primary disorder is respiratory so we have come up the primary disorder is respiratory now we have to see whether the bicarbonate compensation is adequate is adequate for the pco2 so bicarbonate so how much PCO2 has increased, PCO2 has increased, 20 mm -hmm. increase in PCO2, right? Yes. So, probably it will be a chronic issue. We cannot say it is an acute issue or a chronic issue. We are not very sure. How will you know whether it is an acute or a chronic respiratory acidosis? How will you know? How will you know that whether this is an acute respiratory acidosis or whether this patient is having a chronic respiratory acidosis that's basically by clinically only we can differentiate at this point of time here this patient is having a known COPD so there will be some amount of PCO2 build off throughout his time so PCO2 maybe his baseline PCO2 maybe will be somewhere around 50 or 45 we don't know maybe on the high here the normal side but here what you have to see is that if it is a chronic respiratory acidosis if it is a chronic respiratory acidosis for every 10 increase of PCO2, how much bicarbonate will increase? Uh, Approximately 3 to 4 oh. increase of bicarbonate should be there. So, here the bicarbonate uh, PCO2 has increased by 20. Yeah. So, we are expecting around 6 to 8 increase of, P of bicarbonate. But here the bicarbonate is 26. When we look at to this patient, 26.5, you look that it is on the higher side. But ideally, how much should have been the bicarbonate for this patient? Should have been somewhere around 35, 36. Somewhere around 35. But it is only 26. So, what is the reason of this low uh, bicarbonate? There can be another associated metabolic acidosis which we don't know whether we have seen the lactate. What was the lactate level? So, lactate can be one of the other reason. There can be associated what will be the other renal failure, whether any renal failure is there or DKA which we have ruled out with because sugars is only uh, 180. So, what are the issues that you have pointed out from this ABG is that one thing is very clear this patient is hypoxic on why you are saying the patient is hypoxic. So, ABG always we have to see PO2 also. So, hypoxia is there one hypoxia that is for sure because PCO, PO2 is on the lower side which is very 54, it, it should be 60, it, it is 54, 60 to 80 we can take it as normal, maybe for COPD 60 we can take it as normal, there is hypoxia, second thing is that there is hypoxia. respiratory acidosis, respiratory acidosis, so both these things together what we can call this patient is having in type, type 2, 2 respiratory, respiratory failure, <coughs> so type 2 respiratory failure is there, but along with the respiratory acidosis, <coughs> Probably if this patient is having a chronic respiratory acidosis, we are anticipating a bicarbonate of 35, but here it is only 26.5. Bicarbonate is only 26.5. So that means there can be an associated metabolic acidosis also. 
which we need to find out the reason. Once we evaluate the patient, we will come to know. Suppose this patient, uh, imagine that this bicarbonate instead of 35, it is 40. So that what do you think? What is the expected bicarbonate was 35 25. for this PCO2, but now it is 40. There is an associated metabolic alkalosis. Metabolic alkalosis. There can be associated. What could be the most common reason for metabolic alkalosis? Is tachypnic. Metabolic alkalosis, yeah. not respiratory alkalosis. Yeah. Metabolic alkalosis. What could be the most important reason for metabolic alkalosis? Remember, most important reason is hypokalemia. Hypokalemia. So, what, what is the most common reason for hypokalemia for such group of patients? Whether they would have gone to an outside hospital mm -hmm. and they would have received frucimide. Yeah. Frucimide. That is the one of the commonest reasons that you need to find out. So, depending upon the reason, see, hypokalemia can cause metabolic alkalosis and metabolic alkalosis also causes hypokalemia. So, it is like a vicious cycle. So, you have to understand that it can be hypokalemia. If it is there, metabolic alkalosis is the most common reason is hypokalemia. And among hypokalemia, for such group of patients, always remember, frucimide is one of the most common agent that can cause this. Okay, so that is the part of your ABG discussion. So, ABG, we have found out that this patient is having an hypoxia and type 2 respiratory failure and some amount of metabolic acidosis. Depending upon the chronicity of the patient, we will decide. And hypoxia, we have said. Now, coming to the complete blood count. So, there is an increase in the total count. So, I wanted to know what neutrophil percentage or lympho neutrophil bar lymphocyte ratio. Usually, why, why is it is very important, neutrophil lymphocyte ratio? That itself is a marker of your bacterial infection. If there is an increase in neutrophils count, that itself shift to left. That means there is an increase in the neutrophil count. If it is lymphocyte predominant, it is more in favor of an viral, viral infection. So, or tuberculosis, but here probably short history, you have to think in terms of a viral infection. So, total count is increased and CRP is above 230. CRP is above 230. So, two day history of fever, two day history of fever. Then the patient is also having cough with breathlessness and patient has come with hypoxia, Basically, type 2 respiratory failure. Type 2 respiratory failure. So, this is what we have got from this patient. So, these are the two-day history of fever, cough, breathlessness. So, what could be the priority? What could be the reason? There is basically a lower respiratory tract infection which could have precipitated the whole event. It can be viral or bacterial. So, we are not able to predict anything right now. But it can be any of these things. But with maybe a neutrophil predominant it will be more in favor of a bacterial infection rather than a viral infection now coming to the ecg can you comment on the ecg uh, sir, ecg is showing sinus tachycardia sir. so so what is the heart rate here this is the one hour this is another hour so how many large squares are there in between two hour intervals so 300 divided by number of large squares it is approximately two so you can take it as around 150 so 150 is the heart rate so 150 is the heart rate and i want to know whether it is an whenever you see this tachycardia you have set the rate so you have said it is a tachycardia tachy then you have to what else you wanted to know what is the next thing that you wanted to know uh, whether it's a uh, sinus or it is a narrow qrs or a wide qrs, QRS. it is a narrow qrs it is a narrow QRS tachycardia. Next thing I want to know whether it is regular or irregular. Whether it is regular or irregular. Regular. What do you say? It is a regular. regular tachycardia. So we have a patient who is having a narrow QRS regular tachycardia. Now I want to know whether to call it as a sinus tachycardia or whether it is an SVT, supraventricular tachycardia. So, what you have to see? We have to look for P wave. P you are able to see P waves here. Yes. There is P wave here. There is P wave here. There is P wave here. Everywhere you are able to see a P wave. So, what we are dealing with is a sinus tachycardia. What would be the reason for the sinus tachycardia? Because when initially you presented the heart rate was only 118 or 112. Now, it has gone up to 150. What could be the reason? It can be anxiety, fever. It can be due to anxiety, fever, or due to the nebulization, whatever you had given. Yeah. So that could be the reason for increase in heart rate. So it is showing a sinus tachycardia, and you are able to see any STT changes? No. no. There is no STT changes, but what you are able to see here, there is 
there is some amount of left ventricular hypertrophy because both the QRS complexes in V4, V5 it's together and it is kissing each other. So that is showing that this patient is having some chronic left ventricular hypertrophy. It can be a part of his hypertension. He but uh, he was never an hypertension. He was a diabetic. Diabetic and hypertension. Hypertension. Okay, diabetes. So this will be the part of his hypertension. What you are able to see in this ECG. So the ECG diagnosis will be sinus tachycardia with left ventricular hypertrophy. So that will be the ECG changes. Uh, ECG diagnosis for this patient. Okay. Okay, next. Come to check sex ray. Okay. Uh, it's showing uh, hyperinflation of the lung, sir. Okay. So basically, whether it is an AP view or a PA view, that is my first uh, question. PA view, sir. It is a PA view. Why you said it's a PA view? Uh, because uh, the direction of the ribs is one of, one of the things mm. we can come and. I, you could shift him to the X-ray room and get an X-ray. Yes. Yes. Okay. So it's a pain. one thing. I can see some gastric shadow here. Gastric. Shadow. Always when you are seeing that, that is again suggestive of a PA view X-ray. So PA view X-ray. So one thing, it is an expiratory film or an inspiratory film. It is more like an expiratory film because ribs spaces are increased, or it can be a part of a COPD also. So lung feels this grossly distended. Lung feels are grossly distended. Cost of phrenic angle, there is some amount of blending here, and there is minimal blending on this side also. CP angles, both the sides are little bit of blending is there. Then any infiltrates you are able to see in here, some amount of infiltrate here, some amount of infiltrates here, very minimal infiltrate on this side also. But obviously, there is no consolidation as such. So we are not able to see any consolidation. This is the aortic arch, aortic knuckle. That what you are able to see, and hard borders are okay. So there is no uh, major uh, cardiac abnormality. But uh, the size of the heart looks little smaller because that will be the classical of uh, COPD. So you are not seeing any of the consolidation, but there are minimal infiltrate on this side, on this side when we carefully look. And there is something of minimal blending of the cost of any angle. Ideally, the cost of any angle should be like this. It should be very sharp. But here there is some blending of the cost of any angle. So that will be your X-ray finding. Okay. Next. Can we do sample SP? Six-year-old male chronic. Is Sixty smoker. or seventy? You said a seventy. Okay, that is okay. Seventy-year-old male chronic smoker. smoker. Known case of type two diabetes, hypertension, COPD. Okay. Present to the ER with complaints of breathlessness and fever of two days duration. Okay. Uh, the breathlessness was gradual, progressive. Uh, had a score of MMRC four. No orthopnea, PND, syncope, edema. History of fever present associated with chills and there is productive cough also. Okay. No history of any evening rise of temperature. Loss of weight, hemoptysis, or hoarseness of voice. Why you want to ask hoarseness of voice? Uh, sir, any malignancy? Malignancy, okay. But uh, here it is more in favor of a COPD patient uh, who has come with acute breathlessness. What are the differential diagnoses that you will consider after give, getting the sample history? Uh, sir, one is. Uh, one is you said acute exacerbation COPD. of COPD. Acute exacerbation of COPD, okay. Differential diagnosis one. Two. Uh, it can be more in favor of a bacterial because productive of of TC neutrophil predominant increase, so maybe bacterial. But most commonly, what we are seeing is viral. These days, we are seeing a lot of viral, but more in favor of a bacterial. Right now, maybe a total count increased and all. Then second one will be uh, some bronchitis. Bronchitis because two days history unlikely. Then can it be a cardiac failure with fever history? Unlikely because CCF you should have no fever. But what you can remember is that if started to have a fever, maybe this patient is having a co-pulmonate already on top of a wet lung, he has developed a pneumonia. That is one possibility, but here it is very, very unlikely. But what are the other differential diagnosis? Not for this patient, a patient with COPD that is coming to you with acute onset breathlessness. What other differential? I'm not telling about this patient, a patient who is having COPD who has come with breathlessness to the ED, what are the differential diagnosis that you will have? One, as you said, acute exacerbation. Then what will be the next most common? I wanted that from you. Uh, that is right anything. ventricular failure. Right ventricular failure or copalminal, RVF, okay. Acute onset breathlessness, uh, COPD. Pneumo acute on pneumo pneumothorax. Pneumo I just wanted to hear that, pneumothorax. So pneumothorax is the next most common because they can have a large... So this is the x-ray imagine so this is the heart 
so usually they can have a large bullae like this it will be just like in the rib cavity there will be a large bullae this suddenly this bullae can get ruptured so the bullae can get ruptured and they can come with a pneumothorax so that is one of the most differential diagnosis that I always remember so how will you know that uh, this is not uh, uh, pneumothorax it is COPD exacerbation so what are the clinical features by which you will say this is COPD exacerbation acute exacerbation versus pneumothorax so we will start with examination inspection of the chest Starting from the inspection, what will you feel in COPD? Uh, sir, uh, barrel shaped chest. Barrel shaped chest, pneumothorax. Yes. Chest rise. Yes. Chest rise. What can happen to the chest rise? Chest rise can be decreased on both the sides. Yes. It will be decreased on the affected side. So that is one thing that we can do some clinically. Then, what can happen to uh, tracheal shift? Tracheal. Okay, will be mostly central in the case. Central or towards the right, little bit towards the right or central. What will be in pneumothorax to the Shift opposite the side? Opposite if it's a large numerous attack to the opposite side. So that is in pneumothorax, trachea can be shifted to the opposite side. Trachea, then. Trachea, then. So inspection, palpation, percussion. Re note. Be, uh, note can be. Note seen. will be resonant note. Percussion, resonant here. Hyper resonance. It can be hyper resonance. Intention pneumothorax, hyper resonance. Then, next thing, auscultation. Yes, you can get V's or crepes in the case of. V's you can get or crepes can be. Crepitation or decreased air entry or sometimes no air entry also you can get because it can be a silent chest, no air entry. But here, the air entry only will be diminished on the affected okay. side. Decreased air entry on the affected okay. side or no air entry. Or no air entry on the affected side. So that is how we can differentiate. Then clinically, then else what you can do. If there is associated hypotension, we are dealing with most probably with a tension pneumothorax. Hypotension, hy the patient is having hypotension, then distended neck veins. Then mostly we are dealing with a patient with tension pneumothorax. And how can you confirm your diagnosis? If the patient is stable enough, you can get an X-ray. Right. But in, in AD, what else you can do? You can get your ultrasound. ultrasound. USG chest. What do you have to look? Lung sliding sign. Lung sliding sign. Or you can look for barcode sign. sign. Barcode sign, lung sliding sign. If you are able to see lung sliding, that is okay. Confirm. Seashore sign, if you are able to differentiate. But you are able to see a barcode sign. That again suggests you of pneumothorax. So these are the things that you need to do. Okay, continue. Uh, no history of any drug allergies. He was taking medications for hypertension and diabetes. Okay. History of similar episodes in the past. Okay. No history of similar illness in the family. Okay. Come to general examination. Nothing significant. We can go to the next one. Come to systemic examination. Uh, inspection. Uh, barrel shaped chest. Mm. The patient was using accessory muscles for respiration. No crowding of ribs. No supraclavicular. Auscultation. You got bilateral polyphonic yes. waste. Okay. And percussion. Resonant. Okay. Come to other system which was normal. normal. Okay, okay. Come to the final diagnosis. Mm. It was an acute infective exacerbation of COPD. Okay. In type 2 respiratory failure. Okay, very Functional good. Functional status was bedridden okay. with underlying type 2 diabetes and hypertension. Okay. So that is there is no evidence of cardiac failure at this point of time. There is no features of co-permanent. Acute infective, probably we can add, it can be bacterial. We are not very sure. It can be bacterial infection. So how will you manage this patient? What is will be your uh, treatment plan for this patient? You have prepared or you wanted to write, you can write. So how frequently you wanted to give nebulization? So this patient is in in your ER and there is some amount of PCO2 build up to this patient. So you need to take care of the airway. You need to take care of the breathing, circulation and you need to take care of his V's as well as there is some infection going on and diabetes management and hypertension management. So can you just uh, jot down what all drugs that you need to add and what are the prescription? Can, can, can you keep the pen a little bit longer in your hand so that it will not touch the screen? Yes. Sir, initially we put the patient in propped up position. Propped up position. Okay, good. Okay. Then we will start nebulization initially for the, the next patient. advice what you wanted to give no nebulization fine but I wanted to tell right in your case sheet that target saturation what will happen now when you are not there the sister will see I use the saturation is on the lower side we should give him more oxygen so you have to write it down in your case sheet that targeted oxygen target SpO2 of around 
88 to 92 percentage only that is only required so don't give excess o2 to this patient that is very important because this errors can happen sisters they are very concerned about the saturation they will come just increase the oxygen and he will be 100 percent now 65 pco2 will become 120 pco2 so that we don't want to happen then propped up target anything else that you wanted to do for the breathlessness part which we will start for this patient. We can start the patient in NIV. Non-invasive ventilation. So this is again one of the best indication to start. You have ruled out a pneumothorax. You can put the patient on a non-invasive ventilation. Or BiPAP what we can call. Not CPAP here. You should put him on a BiPAP. Bi-level positive airway pressure. So we have an inspiratory support. As well as an expiratory support. And the difference is your peep. So we can put the patient on a non-invasive ventilation BiPAP you can start with what will be the pressures you can start maybe 12.6 you can start and depending upon the next ABG after two hours you can titrate because here this patient is conscious oriented there is no hypotension there is no contraindication for your NIV we can straight away start this patient on NIV BiPAP because PCO2 buildup is also there that will also help to wash out some amount of PCO2 also some amount of uh, tachypnea will also come down so then nebulizations you said How frequent? Uh, three cycles, 20 minutes apart. Sir. Three, three cycles, 20 minutes apart. And uh, after that, what you can do is the whether, the, depending upon the patient's severity, we can uh, decide further doses. Any role for steroids? No, sir. Why? Uh, according to the latest GOAT line, guidelines, mm -hmm. uh, steroids, uh, the inhalational corticosteroids are uh, not of much benefits. IV? Uh, IV steroids also, sir. It's... Uh, Parenteral steroids, maybe in an ED when the patient is having, as per the guideline, they are saying not to for this patient, they have to go for a next level of patient. But here, there is already a PCO2 buildup with audible wheeze. If the patient is not subsiding with nebulization of duodenal of your 3 cycle, definitely you can consider steroid. Initially, steroids can be considered hydrocortisone or whatever be the injection you can give. You can give dexamethasone, hydrocortisone or medial prednisolone depending upon the availability. But if the breathlessness is not settling with your initial uh, nebulization. Role for magnesium sulfate? Uh, ideally in COPD patients. Ideally in COPD it is not recommended. It is more recommended for bronchial yeah, asthma. But if it is refractory to the treatment, yes you can try. But no role for infusion of aminophilin. So aminophilin, all those things, dirifil injection is not totally out. Maybe one or two doses, uh, steroids might help them because that inflammatory part will sometimes it will settle. But otherwise, routine use of aminophilin is not at all required. Then what else you want to start him on an antibiotic? antibiotic. So what antibiotic you will prefer uh, here? Sir, we have to cover the gram positive and atypical organisms. Okay, we have to give gram positive coverage, atypical coverage and he is coming from a community. Okay. So you are not thinking in terms of an uh, pseudomonas or anything. He is coming from the community. So what antibiotic you will suggest here? So we can start initially the patient if needed astromycin. Acetromycin which has got very good gram positive atypical coverage and also it has very good action in the lung. But only problem is that with astromycin you don't have a gram negative coverage. Only issue is that he is a diabetic patient also. So you know, if the diabetes status is well under control that is fine. But if diabetes is not under control we need to always consider a gram negative coverage also. So maybe some drug like ceftriaxone we need to add on or sepharazone sulbactam. So, acetromycin should do or even penicillin augmentin will do initially. That is but atypical coverage. Acetromycin has got better atypical coverage. Or you can even start him on a respiratory quinolone like levofloxacin which has got gram positive, atypical and gram negative coverage. We are not considering TB at this point of time. So, maybe levofloxacin easily we can start for this patient IV antibiotics. Then, diabetes control. What is the target sugars that you wanted here? You are going to give steroids also. So, you need to have a target blood sugar. So, target blood sugar should be somewhere around 180, less than 150, 180, between 150 and 180. That should be your target blood glucose when you are going to admit this patient. Whether he should go to the ICU or to the ward, he is otherwise hemodynamically stable, but only NIV requirement is there. If he is stable after 2 hours just requiring NIV, he can go to a ward where they can support with NIV. But otherwise maybe in high dependency unit for a couple of days and maybe we can wean him off of NIV, then we can start. Anything else you wanted to start for him? Bed ridden, you have written. He is unable to move around. Elderly gentleman, he is going to be like this for another 2 days. 
maybe after 24 hours you have to reassess him and is unable to move we have to start him on a dvt prophylaxis also that you need to keep in mind dvt prophylaxis after 24 hours if the patient is going to be in the bed and he's not able to go to the washroom even without the o2 you need to start him on a dvt prophylaxis and nutrition as i told target blood pressure is 150 180 and one issue that we can have is hypokalemias because of frequent nebulization so it's basically a shift hypokalemia so it is not a real hypokalemia it's just a shifting of the potassium so uh, every time when you check the potassium it will be on the lower side you will start correction but the most important thing you need to decrease the nebulizations then only it will get corrected because it's just a shift of the potassium okay then what else we have to discuss what else we have done crop deposition target oak to niv by hypertension management whatever regular ohs is on or anti hypertensives and ohs is on we can continue if needed we can give on injection short acting insulins okay continue so what is this this is the uh, Goal criteria. Goal criteria. Can you just briefly go through this? Uh, so, uh, this is grading, basically grading of COPD patients. Mm. Initially, we will look at the FEV1 by FEC ratio. It See, that is a problem. How frequently we can do this in our emergency room? He is quite breathlessness and to get done in functional uh, capacity, vital capacity and FEV1 is very difficult. The initial one or two hours is going to be very, very tough. So, with this, it is to say whether it's a gold 1, 2, 3 or 4, it is difficult. Only with the clinical criteria, we can tell. Uh, if you want to be a ratio less than 0 0.7, mm. in those patients based on the uh, post bronchodial FEV1, we will classify into mild, moderate, severe and very severe. More than 80, 50 80, to 80, 80 30, 30 to 50, 50 and less than, less than 30. 30. Okay. Then, uh, mm. according to the gold 2022 guidelines, mm. Uh, we classify patients into A, B, C and D groups Okay. Uh, and the management depends upon like the X axis is the grade of, grade dyspnea, of the dyspnea and the Y axis is the exacerbation. Sir. Okay. So we classify into A, B, C and D. As the dyspnea increases the patient will progress from A to B and exacerbation increases the patient will uh, move from A to, A to C. C. And the management also decreases, uh, changes according to that. For people with uh, class A, uh, we can give any bronchodilator as the drug of choice. Uh, but when the dyspnea increases coming to class, class B, B, we can start the patient on LABA or LAMA. You uh, can just elaborate what is LABA or LAMA. Left against particular advice is also LAMA. So you have to tell them clearly. Uh, long acting beta to agonist and uh, long acting muscarinic agonist. Agonist. So yeah, it is a long acting muscarinic agonist. Yeah. LAMA. Okay. Uh, wise, uh, you can start with 4-metrol and LAMA, uh, titropium bromide. Titropium bromide. Okay. Uh, coming to C, uh, we can start the patient. The drug of choice is LABA. And coming to D, uh, we will start on LABA plus LAMA. Okay, both is, both is needed. So, where will be the category of this patient? What we really discussed? There uh, is dyspnea and dyspnea, exacerbation. Is there. So, the patient will come either in the category C or D. C or D. Okay. Uh, and still, uh, we start on LABA and LAMA. And still, the patient is not improving. Uh, we will look at the eosinophils count, sir. If the eosinophil count is uh, less than 100 and more than 100, if it is less than 100, uh, we will start on uh, LABA plus LAMA and also we will, depending on that, uh, we will start on inhaled corticosteroids. Okay. And still patient is not improving and the FEV1C is less than 50, we will start on Roflo, uh, Roflo will last. Oh, that and is basically a? Uh, Phosphodiesterase. Phosphodiesterase. And also astromycin has also been uh, shown to be effective. Uh, effective, sir. Okay. Then these are the indications for non-invasive ventilation. Uh, PCO2 more than 6. What is the PCO2 difference of 6 to our standards? How will you or 45 mm is it is already written. See, many at the times no, we need to know how to conversion factor from kilopascals to mmsg But here it is already given, it is easy. But when you are going for this UK based exams, they will give you only kilo. Most commonly, you know, sugar, 6 millimoles per liter. We don't know whether it is hypoglycemia, whether it is normal glycemia, we don't know. Into 18, that is for the correction for the blood glucose. Like that for everything, you should know what is the difference. Okay. 7.5, you have to go for an NIV. So, whenever there is a respiratory acidosis, in terms of less than no, pH uh, comes down, you need to start on NIV and other clinical parameters, persistent hypoxemia, invasive ventilation, anytime when the NIV fails or the patient is already in respiratory arrest or the patient has gone into cardiac arrest 
or hemodynamically unstable, we cannot do an NIV or there is an associated complication like a pneumothorax where NIV is not to be done. When we have to give an ICD, then at that time we have to see all those things. Okay. And so and the two more things that is updated in the GOAL 22 guidelines is that initially inhaled corticosteroids was found to be the mainstay of treatment in COPD, CPD. which is not used nowadays because there is increased chances of pneumonia in severe COPD cases. Okay. And also oral corticosteroids are proven to be more uh, side oral effects. Oral or parenteral and have more side, side effects. effects than compared to the benefits. Sir. So we have to be very judiciously using. If you are giving going to give a steroid, it should not be a persistent steroid. One or two doses and you stop it. Just maybe the acute inflammation you can subside and you can stop the steroids. Okay. Because they say main the pathology is because of the that. In asthma, it is the it is mainly an airway, airway issue. Whereas in COPD, there is airway involvement, parenchymal involvement, and pulmonary involvement. That's why uh, corticosteroid is not much of much of use in uh, COPD. So it's basically lama or lava that is most uh, going to help them. Okay, fine. Thank you. Good presentation. Fine.